So can I please get a warm applause for our own CTO and CEO, Derek. Thanks, Renee. Let's see. Thank you. I, I guess you can hear me now. Uh, thanks, great introduction. Um, not sure what to say, so I'll just skip that. So then we're the same in that. I want to talk actually about how rocket science, what it is, um, what my experience is with rocket science, and what I can bring from rocket science into recruitment. Because it's nice if we can say after five years or something that recruitment is rocket science, right? So let's start with a picture of myself. This is me, crunching numbers since the day I was born, right? So this calculator, I had it for breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatsoever. <laughs> and one of the fascinating things is like, I, um, I was born in Mozambique. My father worked for foreign affairs. We traveled a lot, so I was in the, in the plane a lot, but I never cried, so they say. I'm not sure if it's just to make me feel good, but I never cried. Why was that? I was fascinated. How could such a thing like a 747 jumbo jet carry so many people, be so safe? Uh, just like my, my father, he, in the last 10 years, he has flown two million kilometers in, ever, in total. So that, that means that he circumvents the world five times a year. He has never crashed, right? So there's something clearly going pretty well. And I was interested, I didn't want to become a pilot. I wanted to really understand how these magnificent things fly. So I started learning about this in Discovery Channel, and this is one of the favorite like, pinnacles of engineering in that sense, the B-21 bomber. The bomber is not per se the pinnacle of engineering, but the fact that this thing is flying, it has no tail, tail um, wing. And this thing can only fly because there are automated systems, aiding systems that actually help this aircraft fly. If this would be flown uh, manual, I think it would crash and burn every second. So that's what I did. I went to Delft University of Technology and studied aerospace engineering, also known as rocket science. And there are actually two topics which I really found very interesting. The first one you see on the top left, Simona, which is for simulation motion navigation system. It's a simulator. And the practice of human-machine interaction is around how can we make the, 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 the pilot task easier. The second is a laboratory um, aircraft of the Faculty of Aerospace uh, Space Engineering, the PH lab, and there you could test, um, let's say, control systems and learn a lot about the data which aircrafts are gathering. The fascinating thing about aircraft, they are quite safe. However, a paper shows that 70 to 80% of aviation incidents are due to human error. So that could be misjudgments, that could be lack of MRO in this case, or whatsoever, or even German pilots ending up being mentally unstable, what we've seen a couple of years ago. So how can we use aerospace engineering to make aircrafts more safe and, and actually reduce the amount of human error? And there are a couple of things I want to touch upon. The first is ease of use. So I'll show you a video and I'll, I'll walk you through it. And what you actually see is a cockpit of the future, where on the left you see um, what they call a tunnel in the sky. So it's actually a tunnel which you have to fly through to lower the amount of risk. And on the right, you see the flight management system, like the nervous system of an, of an aircraft. You can actually make your own waypoints. It will automatically change the tunnel in the sky and it will guide you to wherever you want to be needed. And then on the front, you see like a thunder cloud. So you want to go past that. And by aiding the, the, the pilots, you and machine interaction, you make it easier for him or her to fly and also lower the amount of human error because the system is really helping the pilots fly. Next one up, intelligence. Uh, you have the Belmer incident in the 90s and there actually the hydraulic system failed and, and we all know what the um, result was of that. What is interesting about machine learning adopted into, into uh, aerospace is that you actually could relearn how, a mo how an aircraft flies. And I'll give you one simple example of machine learning. So this is actually, it's called an inverted pendulum. So it's like balancing a pencil on the, on the tip of your fingers and trying to get, get it on top of that. This is a system which actually doesn't know how, how, how to get the, the weight on top. And it's actually randomly trying 
to get it on top. And it actually works like a dog. Once the, the weight is on top, you actually um, give him rewards, so he will try to mimic this action. And once he doesn't like, succeed, it's a failure, so he gets negative points, and it wants to maximize his score, basically. So you see it's really trying. It's almost like a human emotion to get him up. So it learns to swing up, it's almost there, it's struggling, and then you see that the performance steadily keeps improving, and there's one point in time, I think in a couple of seconds, where it actually succeeds. Almost there, you see it's struggling again. And here it's on, in a near optimal state. 80 seconds of learning, and at the end, here it is. It has learned how to do so, and it's also stable. Pretty cool, if you ask me. And it was 10 years ago. So in the group where I worked with, I mainly dealt with human-machine interaction and control systems. But one of the most important things to make these things work is data. So the A380, what, I think everyone knows it. It's an aircraft that's 80 meters long, has a wingspan of 80 meters, is 30 meters high. How many kilometers of cable do you think is, is in such an aircraft? Any guesses? Five kilometers? 500. He's also from Delft, so that's... Uh, <laughs> right? Delft's... <laughs> It's over 500 kilometers of wiring in this aircraft, and that's actually the main contributor to its weight. It's fantastic, so like all data is combined, and it's put in this simple cockpit. And that's what actually people see in, a, in the A380. They fly, they have the joysticks. On top there are a lot of switches, but basically what happens is in front of them. Okay, so this is great, rocket science, cockpits. Um, how can we make the relation to hiring, or recruitment, or recruitment technology. From what I see, there are actually three things which we can take from aerospace, or what I've seen in aerospace, which we can adopt in recruitment. First of all, combining all data, right? So all those 500 kilometers of wiring should end up in one nervous system. And there are many subsystems in aircraft, right? So you have hydraulics, you have aerodynamics, you have landing gears, you have lights, you have um, defreezing, uh, uh, everything you can think of, and make sure that everything's controllable from one point, and also all, everything is combined. Second, make life easier, what you just saw, like with the, the cockpit of the future. And third is, of course, provide business intelligence, so how to add intelligence on top of all the data to keep that aircraft in the, in the air. So if you talk, zoom in a little bit and combine all data, and talk actually about the heart in that sense of the, of the cockpit, there are a couple of things recruitment which we are trying, which we should combine. ATS CRM data, data which you use for newsletters or email marketing, data with respect to revenue, so for, for agencies, but also employee performance for employers, um, talent pools, communities, and websites. So these are kind of all the data points where the 500 kilometers of wiring go through. Make life easier, right? Making sure that based on this, all this data, things are automated. Make sure that you have the right dashboards to monitor what's going on. And of course, monitoring tasks, which take time, but can ease you if that is doing, being done for you. Provide business intelligence. So how can we adopt artificial intelligence to make sure that things are, are going in an automated manner, uh, manner, but also the right kind, not like with what, what uh, Bill showed us about Amazon. Create reports to make sure that you have the valuable insights in the fingertips of your hand. Enrich the data um, which you're currently gathering and gathering from all of these sources, but using all those data sources to have one holistic view of what is going on. And also, last but not least, rec recommendations and suggestions. Right? So being also proactive in, hey, there, in the case of the aircraft, there's a thunder cloud, fly around it. So we, you know us as a data management platform, but from now on, we will call ourselves the recruitment enablement platform because I think that emphasizes more what we're trying to do here, making sure that we enable you to do your recruitment better. And there are actually three verticals which I want to dive into. So you have the stakeholders which are the managers who manage the operational process of recruitment, but also the business stakeholders. The marketeers who engage with the candidates to make sure that they are seen through job ads or employer branding. And last but not least, of course, the recruiters who are actually doing the tough selling job of getting a candidate matching to an, um, a vacancy and then putting him in front of the either employer or internal hiring manager. 
So how can we empower, empower managers, right? Analyzing the performance recruitment team, what are valuable KPIs? How can we actually, based on these KPIs, predict that operations are not going as smoothly as predicted or there is a kink in the cable? Being able to build your own customizable dashboards, right? So how, that's a little bit of dunglet, you see people laughing, but that's fine. <laughs> Being able to build your own BI dashboard. So how can we make, so like how can we tailor reporting to fit your own need and your own business? And last, what I also mentioned is KPIs. From, from Mark marketeers, craft personalized candidate journeys, what we heard from different topics today, is like how can we personalize journeys? If you see a journey which really is personalized, I get happy, maybe because I'm used to marketing, but it's great to, actually have a automated system really being personalized and, and that you actually end up doing the buying decision because you're happy with the way you are approached. Um, showing revenue and also employee data. It would be interesting to ac actually after a couple of years see, I see that my top performers are coming from these channels, right? Right now we're only looking at applications and in some cases hires. And last but not least, identifying potential candidates from your own database who are on the market again. So, recruiters, adding new candidates to shortlist based on their activity, right? So it would be easy that, that the recruiter will not do the sourcing activity themselves, but we or a system helps creating shortlists to make sure that you know who is on the market and who you can contact <coughs> and, and, uh, and for, uh, to get the position filled creating automated job shortlist even on job creation, like if, that you don't start with a blank sheet, but actually the search has been done for you. And then, again, make it easier to, even if all these shortlist is created, enrich candidate profiles in a database to really make it easier to dive through this gold mine. So, how would our ideal world look like? I think it's, it begins very simple. Recruiter creates a job. Doesn't matter if it comes from, from a customer or a hiring manager, you create a job. But then the platform helps recruitment deter, recruiter determine what is actually the vacancy title and the descriptions or keywords that work, worked in the past for similar positions. What are, and, but, and also give an estimate, so how hard will it be to fill this position? Then, automatically a shortlist is created like, okay, based on the job you had, based on past performance, based on the current audience you have, based on the activity of your database, these are the candidates you should immediately start reaching out to. Then you have your candidates which you're reaching out to, but of course you also have to nurture the candidates that are in your database and are not known to you yet, right? So then an automated way of creating personalized candidate journeys is created to deliver the right message at the right time through the right channel. Then, qualified candidates that didn't apply are looking at jobs, are currently added then to your database because, hey, they are interested. I know they haven't applied because maybe they applied two months ago. They're like, why should I apply again? You know that these candidates are still on the move. So, hey, there are kind of more triggers that you know these candidates are looking for a position and you can really help them out. Enriching candidate records in ATS based on their activity, which I just mentioned, so it makes it easier to search for these um, candidates. And that all while the managers exactly know what's going on with the business, what the forecast will look like, how their hiring velocity is, what the fill rates will be, and at the end, how they can make their hiring managers and customers happy. <coughs> and the most awesome of all, the marketeers who actually are the bridge between the business and the candidates by and was exactly understanding which channels, which messages, which um, efforts should I put into marketing to make sure that we reach the right candidates and make sure that they apply to the jobs you are creating. So this all looks and that is very in the, dis in the, in the distant future, but actually quite a lot of things we're actually <coughs> doing and testing with some of the customers here around as well. <coughs> or some of the developers are already testing this in, in, in their testing environments. So, for example, displaying the performance of similar vacancies, which we then can hoop into the job creation process to make it easier and also a little bit more smooth because you have data to understand what has worked in the past, what will work in the future. Channel revenue reporting. So what is the actually net profit I am getting from se several marketing channels? 
automated shortlisting. So what I just talked about, it, it would be great if you just open your job and automatically a shortlist with all of your candidates which are currently active are popped up. And then last but not least, BI reporting. So we are looking in ways to create customizable BI dashboards so you can actually tailor the dashboards based on your own needs. So that's it, recruitment enablement. How we can take the practices from, or are actually um, from rocket science, put them in recruitment and make uh, uh, rocket science over recruitment. And also, designing such a process is really hard. If you look at aircraft, for example, in A380, the, the amount of teams that are working on that is huge. And they all affect each, of, uh, each other. It's a very complex system, right? So let's say I want to transport 500 people. Then I go to the aerodynamics engineer. He will create a very special wing, which is very efficient. Then this, this, this design of the wing goes to the structural engineer, who will create a mock-up of, of how this wing should be created. But there is a problem. The way you have to create this wing makes it actually heavier because it's a, an old shape. If it becomes heavier, then maybe you can even, um, you go to the engine engineers who then have to create a different engine. And the whole thing is a concurrent design and constant um, negotiation basically on how to align on all these processes. And I think if you talk about recruitment enablement, all stakeholders should be involved in creating such a solution, platform and base to build your digital recruitment on. So, with that message, that's what I wanted to say from on recruit side and conclude. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Wow, you uh, got me just pretty excited about where I'm working. <laughs> um, so thanks for that. Uh, so we have a look to see if uh, there are any questions for you. Sure. There are. <coughs> How personal is the interaction with candidates if it's through automation? So like the, the, the question is, what are you going to automate, right? So I don't believe in 100% AI or machine learning or automated processes. If you look, for example, at Spotify, that's a layered approach, right? So there is a lot of data which is enriched based on genre, um, whatsoever. Based on that, actually there are hand-picked curators who create template lists, and on top of that, there's automation to tailor it to your needs. But there's always this human factor involved to make the judgments. And in this case, the, the, the execution of the whole journey is all